Hello and welcome to World Panorama, where we get your weekly roundup of the top international stories. This week, the world saw the rise of two new presidents, both from different worlds, but speaking a voice of change and peace. Catch all the updates from South Korea and France, but first, the headlines. Over a decade of conservative rule ends in South Korea. Moon Jae-in is elected as president, a strong advocate of peace in the Korean peninsula. Moon promises to enter into a dialogue with the North. Thirty-nine-year-old centrist Emmanuel Macron is France's new president, secures over 65 percent of the votes to beat far-right rival Marine Le Pen. EU leaders hail the verdict. U.S. President Donald Trump courts controversy yet again by abruptly firing the FBI director. James Comey was leading a probe into Trump's campaign's alleged collusion with Russia to rig the presidential poll results. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi takes part in the International Vesak Day celebrations in Colombo on his two-day visit to Sri Lanka, says the visit reflects the strong relationship between the two countries. South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in, has advocated closer ties with neighboring North Korea. In a sign of a break with the hardline approach of his predecessors, Moon expressed his willingness to even go to North Korea to meet Kim Jong-un if it meant bringing lasting peace to the Korean peninsula. Moon also vowed to improve his country's ties with a longtime ally, the U.S. But his adverse views on the deployment of the THAAD anti-missile system has put a question mark over South Korea-U.S. ties. Seoul's policy on North Korea is about to get a major overhaul. In his first speech after being sworn in, South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in, vowed to improve relations with the North, saying he would be willing to visit Pyongyang under the right circumstances. I'll always be on the move for peace in Korean Peninsula. If necessary, I will fly straight to Washington. I will go to Beijing and Tokyo. And if the conditions allow, I even go to Pyongyang. Moon took oath of office in Seoul's National Assembly a day after his decisive win in the election that was called to replace impeached President Park Geun hye The election took place in the backdrop of rising tensions in the Korean Peninsula over North Korea's missile and nuclear program and the subsequent South Korea US military drills and the deployment of controversial US anti missile system THAAD. While Moon has been vocal about his criticism of THAAD, he also talked about further strengthening the alliance with the United States. I will strengthen the South Korea-US alliance. I will negotiate with the US and China with sincerity to resolve THAAD issue. However, Moon is unlikely to get a long honeymoon when it comes to North Korea. Experts have been predicting an imminent nuclear test, North Korea's sixth for weeks now. Under these circumstances, a keen eye would be on how Moon applies the sunshine policy of the Liberal governments of 1998 to 2008 that advocated closer ties between the two Koreas. A key challenge for Moon would also be his handling of ties with China, which retaliated economically over the deployment of THAAD. The Chinese government's position on THAAD issue is consistent and clear. We hope that Republic of Korea pays attention to China's security concerns and appropriately deal with the third question. Apart from handling ties with North Korea, the 64-year-old Democratic Party candidate has also promised to tackle corruption, bolster the economy and address youth unemployment, some of the key concerns for voters. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. All right, so let's discuss the story further. We are joined by former Ambassador Suresh K. Goel in studio with us. Mr. Goel, thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, yes, talking about Moon Jae-in, are you positive? Are you optimistic about his elevation as president? I think uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Moon Jae-in becoming the president, we should expect a lot of change in the relationship between South Korea and the USA on the one hand and North Korea and uh, China. 
where I, where I see it going really is, Munze is clearly pro-talks. And he is going to make all the efforts. In fact, he may come true to his word mm. for visiting North Korea and entering the talks with North Korea. North Korea actually are keen to also have talks with South Korea. Basically, yes. when they do the posturings, they are actually conveying to the world that talks is the only way out. But mm -hmm. if you don't talk to us, there's no way out and we will continue to do what we are doing. USA has been taking a hardline position. They have been actually getting into all those very vituperative kind of statements vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea, which is reflective of every hardline position much longer, much long ago. He said uh, this kind of uh, hardline against North Korea pro is provoked by the uh, test, of course, but uh, it also probably is because Trump himself has taken a position mm -hmm. on this issue. What I now see happening is that Moon Jae-in is going to work with both China and the USA to basically convey that we have to enter into talks with North Korea. And uh, Trump with China yes. actually also uh, suggesting to so USA that they must talk to North Korea mm -hmm. may eventually, you know, give relent and say that, yes, let us get into a conversation mode mm -hmm. with then North Korea. This is Korea. definitely an option on the table that we can perhaps Absolutely. discuss. As far as the third missile is concerned, uh, I think uh, Moon Jae -hi, even earlier, the North Korean, uh, sorry, South Korean people, they were not very happy with the stationing of the third, third mm. missiles mm. because uh, it's a bit of a question mark whether yes. this actually adds to the security of South Korea or, or not. Or, or in fact, brings in more friction, brings in unnecessary more friction. friction. Absolutely. Yeah. So the people have been actually criticizing the positioning of third missiles even earlier. Mm -hmm. Moon Jae -hi, what he's saying is actually reflecting a popular opinion from South Korea. Yes. And I think then when uh, uh, Trump goes on to say that you must pay a billion dollars for the third missiles, yes. it further adds to the debate. So let us see what happens. Mm -hmm. Third missiles are there. Yes. They probably will not be withdrawn for a long time. Yes. But it will become part of the argument to promote talks. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Uh, but you know, uh, apart from U.S. relations and the third deployment, North Korea, uh, you know, at least in South Korea, a lot of political analysts saying uh, that these diplomatic relations aside, the main challenge really for Moon Jae-in right now is economy Absolutely. and the relationship with China because there have been quite <coughs> a few sanctions from China as far as South Korea is concerned. The very fact that it's coming in uh, at least half a year, is it, now that it's been yeah. without a president. Uh, so things really need to catch up. You need, the country needs to catch up as far as economic policies are concerned. Absolutely. I, I, that actually is the point. Uh, however, I think... Uh, Economy, the way South Korea is working, China has a huge investment in South Korea. China, I don't think, is going to withdraw or going to do anything to affect that kind of an economic relationship, nor will South Korea. Hmm. So I think those kinds or kind of statements are for uh, basically to convey yes. the urgency of maintaining the relationship with China. Mm -hmm. I don't think that factor is going to go away. Whoever comes, Moon Jae will use that economic leverage to uh, transform it into a very strong political relationship now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, a, a, that's an important point here. Absolutely. Yeah. And talking about important points and talking about important changes, how do you see the rise of a person like Moon Jae-in, considering that it's been more than 10 years of conservative rule in yes. South Korea? Uh, the very fact that he's talking about something very unusual, in a sense, at least for Korean relations, yes. to try and talk uh, to a North Korean leader. Uh, how do you see that as a person, yes. as an individual, as also a change that perhaps South yes. Korea is seeing? I think uh, uh, people in South Korea, uh, they do not, I mean, from what I understand, uh, North Korea is projected as its threat mm -hmm. to South Korean security, which probably it can be if it comes to a kind of a difference. Yes. But what I, what I understand is the people in South Korea, uh, on their radar, North Korea does not come across as such a strong threat, really. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think there is a kind of uh, neutrality, uh, say that, yes, we can deal with North Korea. Yes. So Moon Jae uh, is reflecting a very popular opinion from South Korea, as far as I understand. Mm. There, uh, he has been given an opportunity to do what people want, and I think it could be transformational movement. Uh, in South Korea versus North Korea. 
provided mm. he is there for a longer time. But okay. so let us see. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Ambassador Goyal, for joining us, giving us an insight really on how the relationships, at least within the Korean Peninsula, uh, has been and what we can look forward to ahead. Thank you so much for being here with Thank us. You. And speaking, in fact, of the other president, French centrist Emmanuel Macron, a former investment banker who has never held elected office, is France's new president. The 39-year-old beat his far-right rival Marine Le Pen in an emphatic victory and soon after has taken some positive steps. Macron has said that he will announce his choice of prime minister after his inauguration as president on Sunday. Here are more details. French President-elect Emmanuel Macron addressing a huge victory rally in front of Paris's Louvre Museum and very symbolically taking to the stage to the European Union anthem, Ode to Joy. Speaking to thousands of supporters, he pledged to represent French values in Europe and the world. Je vous servirai. I will serve you with humility, with strength. I will serve you by remaining true to the Republic principles of liberty, equality and fraternity. I will also serve you to be loyal to the trust you showed me. I will serve you with love. Long live the Republic, long live France. 39-year-old Macron, a former economy minister who ran as neither left nor right independent, took over 65% of the votes to his rival, Le Pen's 35%. His victory was hailed by his supporters as holding back a tide of populism after the Brexit vote and Donald Trump's victory in the US election. His election also represents a long-awaited generational change in French politics, where the same faces have dominated for years. Europe and the world expect us to defend the spirit of enlightenment under the threat in so many places. They expect us to bring some new hope, a new humanism, a world of protected freedom, a world of growth and more ecology. They expect us to be just who we are. As Macron addressed his victory rally, his rival, the anti-EU Marine Le Pen, took the stage in the east of Paris to give a quick speech to her supporters, conceding defeat. Despite the wide margin of the final result, Le Pen's score nonetheless marked a historic high for the French far right. The anti-immigration, anti-EU National Front supporters asserted that the party had a central place as an opposition force in France. I call on all patriots to join us to take part in the decisive political fight that is starting tonight. More than ever in the forthcoming months, France will need you. Long live the Republic, long live France. You have to admit that the defeat is painful, but you have to accept it. In the end, it didn't work. We were dignified in disappointment of the defeat. Now we will see what Macron will manage. What's crucial to note is that voter turnout was the lowest in 40 years. Almost one third of voters chose neither Macron nor Le Pen, with 12 million abstaining and 4.2 million spoiling ballot papers. Macron, who has never held elected office and was unknown until three years ago, is France's youngest president. Next Sunday, he will take over a country under a state of emergency, still facing a major terrorism threat and struggling with a stagnant economy after decades of mass unemployment. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. And with that, it's time for a short break, but still to come. U.S. President Donald Trump fired the director of the FBI over his handling of the inquiry into Hillary Clinton's emails. But Democrats say he was fired because the FBI was investigating alleged links between the Trump campaign and Russia. That and much more on the other side. Unakoti, the famous Shaiva pilgrimage spot in Tripura, dates back to the 8th and 9th century. The name means one less than a crore. It owes its origin to an interesting legend that says Lord Shiva, who was on his way to Kashi, stopped here for a night halt along with gods and goddesses. Together, their number totaled one crore. At sunrise the next day, Lord Shiva was incensed to find all the gods and goddesses still asleep, cursing them to become stone images he left alone for Kashi. 
Unakoti, apart from its rock-cut carvings, has an imposing Shiva head called the Unakoti Shwara Kal Bhairav. Other eye-catching works include three enormous images of Nandi Bull that are half buried in the ground and a gigantic Ganesh. To this day, the logistics of these huge carvings remain a mystery. We have been saving people uh, in terms of accurate forecasts and warnings, etc. At present, as you know, that earthquakes cannot be predicted. We are doing a lot of work on that aspect also to understand the earthquake processes uh, in the Indian uh, subcontinent. I personally feel maybe after 20 years or 30 years, there could be some way of predicting earthquakes. Watch Eureka with Dr. Madhavan Nair Rajivan, Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, only on Rajya Sabha Television. Welcome back. Now, in an unpredictable move, U.S. President Donald Trump fired the director of the FBI, James Comey, this week, saying that he was unable to effectively lead the bureau. But Democrats say that he was fired because the FBI was investigating alleged links between the Trump campaign and Russia. Experts say that Comey tried to strike a balance in a sharply divided political environment, but ended up alienating both sides. been termed as U.S. President Donald Trump's most unpredictable move, firing FBI Director James Comey over his handling of the inquiry into Hillary Clinton's emails. Interestingly, Comey got to know about his termination watching the news on television. White House says Trump's decision came after Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein assessed the situation at the FBI and concluded that Comey had lost his confidence. The termination caps a difficult year for Comey, whose handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation drew scrutiny from both sides of the aisle. You have a system that's working. You have a career prosecutor that lost confidence in the FBI director's ability uh, to carry out his responsibilities. An FBI director who is, who is equally um, questioned by numerous folks on the left who all said that they had a problem. The sudden termination has perplexed not just Comey, but everyone else too. It is noteworthy that last year in July, Comey had declared that investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails should be closed. But just 11 days before the presidential election, the investigation had been reopened. It was a decision Democrats believe caused Clinton victory. Democrats are now suggesting that fiery Comey is a sinister design by Trump to influence inquiry into whether members of the Trump election campaign colluded with Russia. We know the House is investigating Russian interference in our elections that benefited the Trump campaign. We know the Senate is investigating. We know the FBI has been looking into whether the Trump campaign colluded with the Russians, a very serious offense. Were these investigations getting too close to home for the president? Democrats are also calling the move a Nixonian, comparing it to President Nixon's infamous decision to purge the Justice Department during the Watergate investigation. The White House said the search for a successor would begin immediately. It is only the second time the head of the FBI has been fired. The last U.S. president to fire an FBI director was Bill Clinton, who dismissed William Sessions in 1993 over financial irregularities. Bureau report, Rajya Sabhati. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Friday wrapped up his two-day visit to Sri Lanka. Participating in the Vesak Day celebrations, he spoke of the shared heritage of Buddhism between the two neighbours. He also announced starting direct flights between Varanasi and Colombo. Later in the day, he inaugurated a multi-speciality hospital and addressed the Indian origin Tamil community in Dekoya, where he called for celebrations over the diversity between Sinhalese-speaking population and Tamil-speaking people in Sri Lanka.
Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Colombo. Participating in the International Vesak Day celebrations, the biggest festival of Buddhists. Vesak marks the birth, enlightenment and the passing of the Buddha. It was officially recognized by the United Nations in 1999. Modi, who was the chief guest at the festival, was received at the Bandara Naike Memorial International Conference Hall by Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singhe amid traditional fanfare. Sri Lankan President Maitri Pala Sirisena was also present. In his address, Modi re-emphasized the traditional Buddhist connect between the two neighbors, adding that Buddhism's message of peace could be a guiding force during these violent times. Many sub-terrorism in our region is a clear manifestation of this destructive emotion. I firmly believe that Buddhism's message of peace is the answer to growing arc of violence all over the world. Modi said India and Sri Lanka will strengthen ties in trade and economy and also cooperate in various fields including transport, energy, agriculture, education, health and power. Free flow of trade, investment, technology and ideas across our borders will be to our mutual benefit. India's rapid growth can bring dividends of the entire region, especially in Sri Lanka. The Prime Minister also announced direct flights between Colombo and Baranasi from August this year. This will ease travel to the land of Buddha for my brothers and sisters from Sri Lanka and help you directly visit Srivasti, Kushinagar, Sankasa, Koshambi and Sarnath. After the Visak Day celebrations, Prime Minister Modi inaugurated 150 crore rupees a super speciality hospital at Dikoya. The hospital has been built with Indian assistance. Prime Minister Modi also later addressed the Indian origin Tamil community at Tikoya. Invoking MGR and Muthaya Murlitharan in his address, Prime Minister Modi congratulated the Tamil community for their hard work and said that Sri Lanka has benefited from it. We need to strengthen, not separate the states of unity and harmony. And you are perhaps best place to lead such efforts and make your contribution. Prime Minister Modi's visit follows an invitation from President Siri Sena aimed at reinforcing the traditional connect between India and Sri Lanka. This is Modi's second bilateral visit to the country in two years. He last visited the island nation in March 2015. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And now let's bring you up to speed with some more international news updates that you might have missed this week in Globe Watch. French President-elect Emmanuel Macron's party has unveiled more than 400 candidates who will stand in parliamentary elections in June. Half of the candidates chosen were newcomers to politics and half were women. Only 24 of those chosen are outgoing MPs from the current parliament. Iraqi forces faced stiff resistance from Islamic State in northwest Mosul on Sunday after opening a new front against the militants. Having gained a foothold in the northern district last week, Iraqi forces are trying to push down into the handful of remaining districts held by the Islamic State. The new push from the northwest of Mosul began last week after other fronts in the city's southern districts stalled around the old city, where the iconic mosque from which Islamic State leader proclaimed a modern-day caliphate is located. Despite fierce opposition from NATO ally Turkey, US President Donald Trump has approved supplying arms to Kurdish YPG fighters to support an operation to retake the Syrian city of Raqqa from the Islamic State. The US has long supplied arms to the Arab components of the Syrian Democratic Forces, which include YPG fighters. 
Turkey has objected to such a move, raising fears of a backlash that could prompt the Turks to curtail their cooperation with Washington in the struggle against the ISIS. South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in, spoke to the leaders of China and Japan on Thursday. Officials said the leaders agreed that all sides must work together to ease tensions over North Korea's weapons program. Moon Jae-in told Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to look straight at history and not make the past a barrier. And finally, let's head to Bangkok, where hundreds of pooches ran alongside their human owners for a charity in a first-of-a-kind event in Thailand, where canines were allowed to contribute in a charity cause. The proceeds will be used to fund a hospital building. We're leaving you with these visuals. See you again next week.